Hi folks, I am Marina Namchu and welcome to my channel Prep Up with Marina. Today I will be doing a new chapter with you. The name of the chapter is Fritz by Satyajit Ray. This story basically is based on supernaturalism. So now, without wasting much time, let us begin. After having stared at Jayanto for a whole minute, I could not help asking him, Are you well? You seem to be in low spirits today. So, the narrator here, he had been looking continuously at Jayanto. And after some time, he asked him if he was in low spirits. That means if he was feeling depressed. Jayanto quickly lost his slightly preoccupied air. Preoccupied, you know, Jayanto was lost in thoughts. Okay. So, then he gave me a boyish smile and said, No, on the contrary, I am feeling a lot better. This place is truly wonderful. You've been here before. Didn't you know how good it was? I had nearly forgotten. Jayanto sighed. Now, what is to sigh? To sigh is to give a long, deep breath, like this way. Now, some of my memories are coming back slowly. The bungalow certainly appears unchanged. I can even recognize some of the old furniture, such as these cane chairs and tables. So, here as the story uh, you know, begins and it unfolds slowly, we come to know that the narrator and Jayanto, they have come to a particular place. We will, uh, we will learn about this as we read the story. And then here Jayanto, you know, he says that his memories, his old memories, it's slowly coming back to him. And the bungalow in which they are right now staying, it uh, seems unchanged to Jayanto. Because he says that he can still recognize the old cane chairs and tables. The bearer came in with tea and biscuits on a tray. I poured. So the bearer, the bearer is the male servant in, in the bungalow. So he comes with tea and biscuits and the narrator, he pours the tea. When did you come here last? This has been asked by the narrator. 31 years ago. I was six then. So, Jayanto, he just informs uh, the narrator that he had been to this place 31 years ago when he was just six years old. We were sitting in the garden of the circuit house in Bundi. Now, what is a circuit house? It is a rest house. We had arrived only that morning. Jayanto and I were old friends. So, the narrator and Jayanto seemed to be very old friends. We had gone to the same school and college. He now worked in the editorial division of a newspaper and I taught in a school. Although we had different kinds of jobs, it had not made any difference to our friendship. We had been planning a trip to Rajasthan for quite some time. The main difficulty lay in both of us being able to get away together. That had at last been made possible. So here the narrator, he tells us that Jayanto and he had gone to the same school. They were childhood friends. They had even gone to the same college. And now Jayanto, was, he worked in the editorial division of a newspaper, whereas he, that is the narrator, was a teacher. And, uh, you know, they were very, very close friends and they had been planning several times, you know, on coming to Rajasthan, but it had not been possible. But now, finally, they had made it possible and they were here. Most people go to Jaipur, Udaipur or Chitor when they go to Rajasthan. Why? Because, you know, Jaipur, Udaipur or Chitor, uh, you know, besides being beautiful, they have a lot, uh, they have a lot of history behind them. But Jayantu kept talking about going to Bondi. I had no objection for having read Tagore's poem, The Fort of Bundi, I was certainly familiar with the name of the place and felt a pleasurable excitement at the prospect of actually seeing the fort. 
so you know when they had this, uh, when they were planning to come uh, to jaipur uh, sorry to rajasthan uh, you know uh, jayanto had insisted on coming to bondi now uh, the narrator was not familiar with uh, uh, bondi i mean in the sense that he had not visited bondi but he had actually read a poem uh, that had been written by tagore not many people came to bondi but that did not mean that there was not much to see there it could be that from the point of view of a historian udaipur jodhpur and chitor had a lot more to offer but simply as a beautiful place bondi was perfect so here uh, the author is comparing uh, you know uh, udaipur jodhpur and chitor to bondi and bondi Uh, just you know it was just a beautiful place maybe it did not have so much of history to offer like the other places had in rajasthan however jayanto's insistence on bundi did puzzle me somewhat but you know the narrator was slightly puzzled you know he was a little confused why was jayanto insisting on going to bundi and no other place i learned the reason on the train when we were coming down Jayanto's father Animesh Das Gupta had worked in the archaeological department his work sometimes took him to historical places and Jayanto had as a child come to Bundi so now the narrator came to know you know as they were traveling uh, in the train uh, to Rajasthan it was here that Jayanto actually told the narrator that he had been to Bundi why because his father uh, you know he had worked in the archaeological department so he uh, you know his work used to take him to all these historical places so one time he had also come to bundi and uh, uh, jayanto had accompanied his uh, family he had always wanted to return after growing up just to see how much the mod- modern bundi compared to the image he had in his mind so you know after he had visited bundi at the age of 6 you know jayanto had made up his mind and he uh had decided that one day he would again go back and compare the modern bondi with the ancient one so that's why he was here with his uh friend the circuit house was really rather splendid it was magnificent built during the time of the british it must have been at least 100 years old so the circuit house in which they were staying it was 100 years old because it had been built during the time of the british it was a single storied building with a sloping tiled roof the rooms had high ceilings and the skylights had long dangling ropes which could be pulled to open and shut them all right so the room had very high ceilings and uh, and the skylights okay what are skylights now skylights are window windows uh, you know uh, which is built into the roof so as to let the sunlight in so these skylights had dangling roofs uh, dangling sorry dangling ropes because they were right on top so uh, you know to kind of make it easy to open and close them uh, the ropes were attached to them the veranda faced the east right opposite it was a huge garden with a large number of roses in full bloom behind these were a lot of trees which obviously housed a vast section of local birds so there was a garden there uh, we are told and um, yeah, you know uh, there were a number of roses that were blooming and behind the roses the rose bushes you know there were a couple of trees uh, which obviously housed housed means which provided shelter to the local birds parrots could be seen everywhere and peacocks could be heard but only outside the compound so the peacocks could be heard only outside the compound not inside the compound we had already been on a sightseeing tour of the town the famous fort of bundi was placed amidst the hills so the fort of bundi which they had actually seen from afar the previous day you know it was in the middle of the hills we had seen it from a distance that day but decided to go back to take a closer look 
The only reminders of modern times were the electric poles. Otherwise, it seemed as though we were back in old Rajputana because the, the structure, you know, the carvings, you know, it, uh, it gave you a very ancient feel. The streets were cobbled. Cobbled, that means the rough surface was made of small stones. The houses had balconies jutting out. Jutting out means sticking out from the first floor. The carvings done on these and the wooden doors bore evidence of the work of master craftsmen. It was difficult to believe we were living in the age of machines. So, you know, the houses were, uh, you know, uh, they had carvings uh, on the windows, the doors, uh, you know, uh, which told, which told um, the people, which told them that, uh, you know, very talented craftsmen had actually worked there, had done this beautiful work. And, uh, you know, uh, the narrator says that it was difficult to imagine that, uh, you know, they were living in, the, uh, in a world of machines after looking at all this ancient architecture. I noticed J Jayanto had turned rather quiet after arriving in Bundi. Perhaps... Some of his memories had returned. It is easy enough to feel a little depressed when visiting a place one may have seen as a child. So, you know, Janto had become all of a sudden very, very quiet. And the narrator says that was very natural, especially, you know, uh, uh, when you have visited a place when you were a little child and then you go back again, you know, you, you, you have very, you, you start, you tend to get, uh, you know, nostalgic, okay? Besides, Janto was certainly more emotional than most people. So this is one character that we come to know about Janto. He was a very emotional person. Everyone knew that. He put his cup down on the table and said, you know, Shankar, it is really quite strange. The first time I came here, I used to sit cross-legged on these chairs. It seemed as though I was sitting on a throne. Now the chairs seem both small in size and very ordinary. If I hadn't returned, those memories would have remained stuck in my mind forever. So, you know, <clears throat> now Jayanto tells Shankar, his friend, that, you know, earlier when he had come with his parents, uh, he had sat on that same chair and he had at that point of time felt as if he was sitting on a throne. That is because, you know, he was a very small child, just, you know, he was six years old. So he's, he, he says, uh, he tells Shankar that he used to sit cross-legged on the chair, all right? But now everything has changed. He doesn't find the chair so huge, you know, like a throne anymore. And uh, the drawing room here used to seem absolutely enormous. You know, at that point of time, he had found the drawing room to be really very spacious. If I hadn't returned, those memories would have remained stuck in my mind forever. So he says, if I hadn't returned back to Bundi, I would have imagined the same thing. That same memory would have been stuck in my mind. I said, yes, that's perfectly natural. As a child, one is small in size, so everything else seems large. This is very true. One grows bigger with age, but the size of all other things remains the same, doesn't it? That even we realize that in our lives, isn't it? When we are little children, we always find things looking really big, really gigantic, you know. But later on, as we age, we find that actually it is not. They are of normal size. It's just uh, because of our age, you know. When we are little, we find everything very big. We went for a stroll in the garden after tea. Now, what is a stroll? What is going for a stroll? Going for a stroll means going for a leisurely walk. So they went for a leisurely walk in the garden after tea. Jayanto suddenly stopped walking and said, Deodor. I stared at him. A deodor tree. It ought to be here somewhere, he said, and began stri striding towards the far end of the compound. 
Why did he suddenly think of a deodor tree? So, you know, as they were walking, suddenly Jayanto, he just said deodor. All right. And then he started walking fast, you know, towards the other end of the compound. And uh, Shankar was taken aback. He was wondering what, what happened. Why did he suddenly mention a deodor tree? A few seconds later, I heard his voice exclaiming jubilantly, jubilantly, very happily. Yes, it's here, exactly where it was before. Of course, it's where it was before, I said. Would a tree go roaming around? Sorry, roaming about? Jayanto shook his head impatiently, impatiently, irritably. No, that is not what I meant. All I meant was that the tree is where I thought it might be. But why did you suddenly think of a tree? Shankar asks him that. Jayanto stared at the trunk of the tree, frowning. Frowning means making an angry or worried expression. Then he shook his head slowly and said, I can't remember that now. Something had brought me near the tree. I had done something here. A European. European? You know, so when uh, uh, Shankar asks him, you know, why did you think of a tree, this deodor tree suddenly? You know, uh, Jento is uh, not able to um, understand, it, understand it himself as to why he had thought of a deodor tree. He says that he was just brought there. And suddenly he says the word European. No, I can't recall anything at all. Memory is a strange business. Then he's not able to recall anything. They had a good cook in the circuit house. Later in the evening, while we sat at the oval dining table having dinner, Jayanto said, The cook they had in those days was called Dilawar. He had a scar on his left cheek and his eyes were always red. But he was an excellent cook. So now he remembers the cook. Slowly the memory, uh, you know, of the past is flowing back. Jento's memories began returning one by one soon after dinner, when we went back to the drawing room. He could recall where his father used to sit and smoke a chirut. What is a chirut? It is a cigar. Where his mother used to knit and what magazines lay on the table. So all these little, you know, details started um, coming back uh, to his mind. And slowly, in bits and pieces, in bits and pieces, he recalled the whole business about his doll. So, you know, slowly his memory, as I told you, started coming back to him. He started remembering certain details and then he came to, uh, you know, suddenly he remembered his doll. It was not the usual kind of doll little girls play with. One of Jayanthu's uncles had brought for him from Switzerland a 12-inch long figure of an old man dressed in traditional Swiss style. Apparently, it was very lifelike. It was like a human being, okay? Although it was not mechanized, it was possible to bend and twist its limbs. Its face had a smile on it and on its head, it wore a Swiss cap with a little yellow feather sticking out from it. Now, this is the description of the doll, so it's important for you to remember it. Its clothes, especially in their little details, were perfect. Belt, buttons, pockets, collars, socks. There were even little buckles on the shoes. So, these minute details, boys and girls, you need to try and remember. His uncle had returned from Europe shortly before Jayanto left for Bundi with his parents. The little old man had been bought in a village in Switzerland. The man who sold him had jokingly said to Jayanto's uncle, He's called Fritz. You must call him by this name. He won't respond to any other. So, we come to know that this particular doll that Jayanto remembers was gifted to him by his uncle, who had actually, uh, you know, uh, been to Europe and he had bought it in Switzerland. And while buying the doll, uh, the... The shopkeeper had told him that he had to uh, call the doll Fritz, 
otherwise it would not respond. You know, this was said very jokingly. Jayantu said, I had a lot of toys when I was small. My parents gave me practically everything I wanted. Perhaps because I was their only child. So here we come to know that Jayantu's parents used to pamper him because he was their only child. But once I had Fritz, I forgot all my other toys. I played only with him. A time came when I began to spend hours just talking to him. Our conversation had to be one-sided, of course. Why? That is because Fritz was a doll. It could not respond, isn't it? But Fritz had such a funny smile on his lips and such a look in his eyes that it seemed to me as though he could understand every word. So, you know, um, Jayantu tells us that uh, he had many toys because his parents used to really, you know, buy everything for him. But once he got fr Fritz, he stopped playing with the other toys and he used to just spend his time only with Fritz. And he says that, you know, uh, the look that Fritz had, it seemed as if, uh, you know, Fritz understood what Jayanto was telling him. Sometimes I wondered if he would actually converse with me if I could speak to him in German. Now it seems like a childish fantasy, but at that time, the whole thing was very real to me. So he's telling Shankar that, you know, at one time, he thought that if he knew the German language and if he spoke to the doll, the doll would respond to him. But now he realizes that now he's a grown-up man, he realizes that that was just a childish fantasy. That means an imagination of a child. My parents did warn me not to overdo things, not to go beyond limits. But I listened to no one. I had not yet been put in school. So I had all the time in the world for Fritz. So his parents were also quite worried and they used to tell him, don't indulge too much, you know, don't play with the doll too much. But he never listened to anyone. Jayanto felt silent. I looked at my watch and realized it was 9.30 p.m. It was very quiet outside. We were sitting in the drawing room of the circuit house. An oil lamp burnt in the room. I asked, what happened to the doll? Jayanto was still deep in thought. He was thinking. His answer to my question came so late that, by that time, I had started to think that he had not heard me at all. I had brought it to Bundi. It was destroyed here. So that, that was what had happened to the doll. Destroyed? How? Shankar asks him. Jayanto sighed. We were sitting on the lawn having tea. I had kept the doll by my side on the grass. I was not really old enough to have tea, but I insisted, and in the process, the cup tilted and some of the hot tea fell on my pants. So, uh, he's r relating what happened to his doll, okay? I ran inside to change and came back to find that Fritz had disappeared. I looked around and found quite soon that a couple of stray dogs were having a nice tug of war with Fritz. Nice tug of war? They were pulling it from uh, opposite direction, okay? Although he didn't actually come apart, his face was battered. It was battered, you know? Battered means when something is injured uh, due to repeated blows, okay? Beyond recognition and his clothes were torn. In other words, Fritz did not exist for me anymore. He was dead. So when Shankar asks him, you know, what happened to his doll? What happened to Fritz? You know, Jayanto tells, he relates that incident. He says that one day, you know, although he was very small and he was not supposed to have tea, but he insisted on having tea. And he was sitting on the lawn and um, uh, Fritz was lying on the grass beside him. Uh, what happened was he spilled tea on his trousers. So he went indoor to the house to change, to change his trousers. But when he came back, he, did, he could not find Fritz around at all. And when he looked around, he saw a couple of stray dogs having a nice tug of war. All right. And Fritz was totally destroyed. And for Jayanto, 
Fritz was dead. All right. And then, and then, Jayanta's story intrigued me. So, you know, Shankar is now very interested. So, intrigued. Intrigued means, you know, the story of, uh, the story which is uh, told about Fritz by uh, Jayanta to Shankar intrigues him. Intrigues him means it arouses interest, right? And he wants to know more. What could possibly happen after that? I arranged his funeral, that's all. Well, actually, you arrange funerals for human beings, not for your, you know, not for something inanimate, you know, some non-living thing. But uh, Jayanto, we are told here that he arranged a funeral for Fritz. So Shankar says, meaning? Then Jayanto says, I buried him under the deodor tree. I had wanted to make a coffin. Now, what is a coffin? A coffin is a box where you put in the dead body of a person after a person dies okay fritz was after all a european but i could find nothing not even a little box so in the end i buried him just like that at last the mystery of the deodor tree was solved so now uh, shankar finally came to know about the deodor tree about fritz okay we went to bed at around 10 our room was a large one and our beds had been neatly made. Not being used to doing a lot of walking, I was feeling rather tired after the day's activities. Besides, the bed was very comfortable. I fell asleep barely 10 minutes after hitting the pillow. You know, the narrator, you know, he says that he was very, very tired after the whole day's, you know, activities. So as soon as he hit the pillow, hit the pillow means as soon as his head lay on the pillow, he was fast asleep. A slight noise woke me up a little later. I turned on my side and found Jayanto sitting up on his bed. The table lamp by his bed was switched on and in its light, it was easy to see the look of anxiety on his face. So, you know, in the middle of the night, the narrator, that is Shankar, he woke up because he heard some noise. And when he looked across, he saw Jayanto on his bed. <coughs> Sorry. And, you know, there was a look of anxiety. You know, uh, Jayanto was looking very anxious. Okay. I asked, what is it? Are you not feeling well? Instead of answering my question, Jayanto asked me one himself. Do you think this circuit house has got small animals? I mean... Things like cats or mice? I shouldn't be surprised if it does. Why? Something walked over my chest. That's what woke me up. Rats and mice usually come through drains. But I've never known them to climb on the beds. This is the second time I've woken up actually. The first time I had heard a shuffling noise near the window. So here we come to know that Jayanto had, this was the second time actually he was waking up in the night because the first time, you know, he had heard a shuffling noise near the window. Shuffling noises, you know, when somebody walks without lifting the feet. Oh, if it was near the window, it is more likely to be a cat. That is what Shankar says. Yes, but Jento is not very sure. Jento still sounded doubtful. I said, didn't you see anything after you switched the light on? Nothing. But then I didn't switch it on immediately after opening my eyes. To tell you the truth, I felt rather scared at first. But when I did switch it on, there was nothing to be seen. That means whatever came in must still be in the room. Well, since both the doors are bolted from inside... I rose quickly and searched under the bed, behind our suitcases and everywhere else in the room. I could not find anything. The door to the bathroom was closed. I opened it and was about to start another search when Jenta called out to me softly. Shankar. So, you know, when... Uh, Shankar gets up and he sees uh, Jayanto uh, looking very anxious and worried, you know. Um, he asks uh, Jayanto, 
whether he had seen anything when he had switched on the light. But uh, Janto uh, replies by saying that, you know, he was very frightened at first when he heard the noise and, uh, you know, um, even before switching on the light and after switching on the light, like he had not looked for anything. He was too frightened. All right. So uh, they, they are searching the room now. And uh, when they are searching, when the narrator is searching, you know, under the bed and behind the suitcases everywhere in the room, suddenly um, he is called by uh, Jayanto. I came back to the room. Jayanto was staring hard at the cover of his quilt. Upon seeing me, he pulled a portion of it near the lamp and said, Look at this. I bent over the cloth and saw tiny brown circular marks on it. I said, well, these could have been made by a cat. Jento did not say anything. It was obvious that something had deeply disturbed him. But it was 2.30 in the morning. I simply had to get a little more sleep or I knew I would not just, I would just keep feeling tired. And we had plans of doing a lot of sightseeing the following day. So what happened? You know, um, as I told you, uh, Shankar was looking under the bed and around behind the suitcases and all that for whatever had entered the room. And, um, you know, at this point of time, Jayanta calls Shankar and then tells him to look at something on the, uh, on the quilt. And uh, what does he see? He sees brown circular marks and Shankar notices that this thing has really disturbed Jento. and uh, although uh, he would have uh, liked to kind of uh, you know kind of uh, talk to Jento, he realizes that it's already 2 30 uh, and uh, he needs to sleep otherwise he he would be feeling very tired the next day as they had already decided to do a lot of sightseeing okay so, after murmuring, murmuring means speaking very softly, a few soothing words. Soothing words means words of comfort, such as, don't worry, I am here with you. And who knows, those marks may have been on your quilt already when you went to bed. I switched off the light once more and lay down. I had no doubt that Janto had only had a bad dream. So, Shankar thinks that it was just a kind of a nightmare, you know, that... Um, uh, Jento has had. All those memories of his childhood had upset him, obviously, and that was what had led to his dreaming of a cat walking on his chest. I slept soundly for the rest of the night. If there were further disturbances, Jento did not tell me about them. But I could see in the morning that he had not slept well. So uh, Shankar, you know, after that, after pacifying, you know, uh, Jento, uh, after pa pacifying Jento and telling him, you know, it's nothing uh, to go to sleep, like he tells him, you know, it's just a bad dream that you've been having. You know, he goes off to sleep and he has a good sleep. But in the morning when he gets up, he sees that uh, his friend Jento has had a restless night. Tonight, I must give him one of the tranquilizers I brought with me, I thought. So he decides to give Jento, his friend, a tranquilizer. Now, what is a tranquilizer? It is a drug which can uh, reduce tension and anxiety. We finished our breakfast by nine as we had planned and left for the fort. A car had already been arranged. It was almost 9.30 by the time we reached. Some of Jento's old forgotten memories began coming back again, though fortunately, they had nothing to do with his doll. In fact, his youthful exuberance, exuberance, excitement, made me think he had forgotten all about it. Then again, you know, Shankar notices that uh, Jento is back to normal and he's quite excited about the trip and, you know, moving around the place, sightseeing. And he thinks that he has finally forgotten about um, everything, about uh, the incident um, that happened in the night. There, there's that elephant on top of the gate, he exclaimed. And the turrets, what are turrets? Turrets are uh, small towers. And here is the bed made of silver and the throne. <clears throat> Look at that picture on the wall. <clears throat> Sorry.
Look at that picture on the wall. I saw it the last time. So, you know, he has seen these things earlier, uh, you know, when he had come to Bundi uh, uh, with his parents. So he is telling Shankar, relating uh, all those things, okay, whatever they see. But within an hour, his enthusiasm began to wane. Wane means it began to die out. I was so engrossed myself that I did not notice it at first. But while walking through a hall and looking at the chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, I suddenly realized Jento was no longer walking by my side. Where was he? <clears throat> All right. So first, let's go back. What are sh uh, chandeliers? You know, he was walking through the hall, looking at the beautiful chandeliers. All right. Hanging from the ceiling. What are chandeliers? You know, chandeliers, actually, they are large, round, big frames. Okay. Uh, and the frames have, you know, different uh, branches. You must have seen them uh, in, the, in the movies and things like that. And these uh, branches, they, uh, you know, uh, uh, these um, projections, they hold the lights or the candles. Okay. Those are chandeliers. Then suddenly he realized, Shankar realized, that Jayanto was not beside him anymore. Where was he? he? He's asking himself. We had a guide with us. Babu has gone out on the terrace, he told me. I came out of the hall and found Jayanto standing absent-mindedly near a wall on the other side of the terrace. He did not seem to notice my presence even when I went and stood beside him. He started when I called him by his name. So Jayanto was lost in thought, you know, he was standing on the terrace. And so when Shankar went and called him by his name, he kind of, you know, he was a little startled. All right. What on earth is the matter with you? I asked. Why are you standing here looking morose? Morose means sad. Even in a beautiful place like this, I can't stand it. Jayanto simply said, have you finished seeing everything? If so, let's. Had I been alone, I would definitely have spent a little more time at the fort. But one look at Janto made me decide in favor of returning to the circuit house. So, you know, maybe Janto was looking too tired or maybe he was looking troubled. So Shankar decided to leave and to go. A road through the hills took us back to town. Janto and I were both sitting in the back of, a, of the car. I offered him a cigarette, but he refused. I noticed a veiled excitement in the movement of his hands. A veiled excitement means, veiled means, you know, something which is not expressed clearly, all right? Uh, he was moving his hands, you know, as if uh, out of some excitement, all right? One moment he placed them near the window, then on his lap, and immediately afterwards began biting his nails. It shows you, you know, this is a sign of... Uh, um, um, anxiousness or nervousness. Janto was quiet by nature. This odd restlessness in him worried me. After about 10 minutes, I could not take it any more. It might help if you told me about your problem, I said. Janto shook his head. You know, Shankar was so worried. He was, he was a very good, of, a good friend of Janto, you know. So he was very worried about his friend. Why was he acting in this manner? So he told him, like, why don't you share your problem with me? But Jayanto just shook his head. It's no use telling you, for you're not going to believe me. Okay, even if I don't believe you, I can at least discuss the matter with you, can't I? So, you know, Jayanto refuses to tell him because he feels that Shankar would not understand him or believe him. Fritz came into our room last night. Those little marks on my quilt were his foot footprints. There was very little I could do at this except catch hold of him by the shoulders and shake him. How could I talk sensibly to someone whose mind was obsessed with such an absurd idea? Absurd? Strange or foolish idea. How could Fritz, a Fritz, you know, a doll. It was a doll which he had when he was six years old. And, uh, you know, uh, a doll which he had buried under the deodor tree. How could it come back? How could a doll, an inanimate thing, come alive? This is what Shankar is saying, you know, it was absurd. The idea was, you know, really strange. It was really foolish. You didn't see anything, did you? I said, finally. No, but I could distinctly feel that whatever was walking on my chest had two feet, not four. 
As we got out of the car at the circuit house, I decided that Janto must be given a nerve tonic or some such thing. A tranquilizer might not be good enough. I could not allow a 37-year-old man to be so upset by a simple memory from his childhood. I said to Janto upon reaching our room, It's nearly 12 o'clock. Should we not be thinking of having a bath? You go first, said Janto, and flung himself on the bed. So he just lay on the bed. An idea came to my mind in the bath. Perhaps this was the only way to bring Janto back to normalcy. So while he was having a bath, you know, Shankar, he thought of a plan. A plan which could help his friend come back to normalcy, to be normal again. If a doll had been buried somewhere 30 years ago, and if one knew the exact spot, it might be possible to dig the ground there. No doubt most of it would have been destroyed, but it was likely that we'd find just a few things, especially if they were made of metal, such as the buckle of a belt or brass buttons on a jacket. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> My throat seems to be... <clears throat> troubling me a bit. I'm so sorry. If Janto could actually be shown that that was all that was left of his precious doll, he might be able to rid himself of his weird notions. Otherwise, he would have strange dreams every night <clears throat> and talk of Fritz <coughs> and talk of Fritz walking on his chest. If this kind of thing was allowed to continue, he might go totally mad. <coughs> so, you know, uh, what happens is, uh, uh, Shankar, he decides, he plans out something, you know. He thinks, like, if they had to go and dig up the deodor tree, near the deodor tree where he had buried Fritz, you know, they would definitely find, you know, uh, um, a metal button or a brass button or a buckle, you know, that belonged to the doll, you know. So, uh, and then he could kind of change uh, Jayanto's way of thinking, the notion about Fritz coming back to him in the night, okay. <clears throat> or he feels that his friend might go totally insane. Jayanto seemed to like my idea at first, but after a little while he said, Who will do the digging? Where will you find a spade? I laughed. Since there is a garden, there is bound to be a gardener. And that would mean there is a spade. If we offered him a little tip, I have no doubt that he would have no objection to digging up a bit of ground near the trunk of a tree at the far end of the lawn. <clears throat> Jayanto did not accept the idea immediately, nor did I say anything further. He went in and had his bath after a little bit of persuasion. At lunch, he ate nothing except a couple of chapatis with meat curry, although I knew he was quite fond of his food. So, you know, <coughs> Jayanto seemed to be even losing his appetite. After lunch, we went and sat in the cane chairs on the veranda that overlooked the garden. There appeared to be no one else in the circuit house. There was something eerie, eerie means mysterious or frightening, about the silence that afternoon. All we could hear was a noise made by a few monkeys sitting on the Gulmahar tree across the cobbled path. So, you know, the narrator has even described the scene like there was some, you know, uh, um, mysterious air, you know, that afternoon. Around 3 p.m., we saw a man come into the garden, carrying a watering can. He was an old man. His hair, moustaches and sideburns were all white. So I think he was the gardener. Will you ask him or should I? <clears throat> at that question, at this question from Janto, I raised a reassuring hand and went straight to the gardener. After I had spoken to him, he looked at me rather suspiciously. Now, naturally, why would somebody ask you to dig, you know, there, I mean, near the deodor tree? Clearly, no one had ever made such a request. 
It was a strange request indeed. Why, Babu? He asked. I laid a friendly hand on his shoulder and said, Don't worry about the reason. I'll give you five rupees. Please do as you're told. He relented. He relented? The gardener agreed. Going so far as to give me a salute, accompanied by a broad grin. I beckoned, so he motioned to Janto, who was still sitting on the veranda. He rose and began walking towards me. As he came closer, I saw the pallor on his face. Pallor means the paleness, okay? I did not, sorry, I did hope we would find at least some part of the doll. The gardener, in the meantime, had fetched a spade. The three of us made our way to the deodor tree. Janto pointed at the ground about a yard from the trunk of the tree and said, Here. So Janto showed the spot where he had buried Fritz. Are you sure? I asked him. Janto nodded silently. How much did you dig? And then Janto says, At least eight inches. He had dug eight inches. The gardener started digging. The man had a sense of humor. As he lifted his spade, he asked if there was hidden treasure under the ground and, if so, whether we would be prepared to share it with him. I had to laugh at this. But Janto's face did not register even the slightest trace of amusement. He was all very serious, all right? Very, he was concentrating on what the gardener was doing. It was the month of October and not all and not at all warm in Bundi. Yet, the collar of his shirt was soaked in sweat. Soaked means it was totally covered. It was not warm. It was October, all right? But his collar was soaked in sweat. It was covered with sweat. He was staring at the ground unblinkingly, unblinkingly, very steadily, okay? The gardener continued to dig. Why was there no sign of the doll? The raucous cry of a peacock made me turn my head for a moment and in that instant, Jento made a strange sound. All right. The raucous. The raucous, the raucous means uh, a very uh, long and rough sound. Okay. So, and then suddenly, Jento, he made a very strange sound. I quickly looked at him. His eyes were bulging, almost popping out, you know. He raised his right hand and pointed at the hole in the ground with a finger that was visibly trembling. Then he asked in a voice turned hoarse, hoarse means rough, with fear. What? What is that? The spade slipped from the gardener's hand. I too gaped at the ground. Gaped means kept on staring at the ground. Open-mouthed in horror, amazement and disbelief. Disbelief? He could not believe what he was seeing. There lay at our feet, covered in dust, lying flat on its back, a 12-inch long, pure white, perfect little human skeleton. So, we see that at the end, they do dig up the ground near the deodor tree. And what do they find? They find a 12 inch long, pure white, perfect little human skeleton. Now remember, Fritz was a doll. And here the, narrat uh, the narrator tells us that they find a skeleton. The skeleton you find only uh, only human beings or you know I mean living things have uh, you know uh, will have a skeleton after you know uh, will have a skeleton all right only human beings or animals or even birds fish they'll have bones but you cannot expect that from a doll. And how was this possible? So, you know, the story has been left. It's an open-end story. We could say that. 
right? We have to, uh, the, uh, the, the author has uh, concluded it in such a way that the reader has to draw his or her own conclusion. So, um, it is a little uh, frightening, the story. If you have uh, been um, attentive while we have been doing it, and uh, as I told you right at the beginning, uh, before we started the lesson, that the story is based on supernaturalism. All right, with that, we come to the end of the chapter, boys and girls. And I would just like to remind you that there will be another video uh, which will be following uh, very soon where we will deal with uh, the other important points like, for example, the title, the theme, the characteristics. I will do that in my next video on this chapter. So please don't forget to uh, watch my videos and uh, stay tuned. Bye-bye.